Uh, purpose of the advisory committee is to serve as uh, an advisory committee to the staff on the housing element process, the engagement process in particular, uh, be a sounding board for draft policies when we get into that in a few months. Um, <clears throat> real important that this be an inclusive process. One of the requirements of the state now is they'll be looking to make sure that we have broad representation and that we've made an effort to hear from those who don't traditionally get involved. Um, this is a, a group that helps us to make sure we are crafting pro-housing policies. Uh, we look to be liaisons to constituencies that you represent. Um, and we want to make this a safe place for open, honest conversations. So um, be respectful of differences of opinion. Um, you know, listen to understand all those all those rules apply. Um, and we will do our best to, to create a place where where a diversity of perspectives is heard and responded to. And generally we're set up to meet every two months. Uh, we last our first meeting was in May and now it is July. Um, as we get into creating draft materials, we'll be sharing those out and asking for your feedback in between meetings. Um, and then, as I mentioned previously, asking you to help us with outreach as needed. And I think one of the questions I just wanted to pose, I, and we've got a list of folks who are on the committee who not everyone is represented today and showing up at the meeting. But I don't know if Anastasia you want to say a few words about who's not here and then just see if there's any thoughts people have about how to make sure we are a representative group. Yeah, I mean, we had we have a long list of <laughs> invitees. I'm not going to go through each one of them, but um, we do want to try to include as many people as possible in this advisory group. And I have had feedback from our planning commission to make this group a little more formal and detail who's in the group. Um, so I'm hoping everyone will be OK with that. And if there's anybody that you feel we could um, pull into our housing advisory group here, housing element advisory group. Um, just go ahead and put it in the chat and I'll take note of that. Or um, if we want to really quickly talk about that, uh, we have, you know, some from the school board. We have housing developers, both nonprofit and for profit. Thank you all for being here. Um, we have an architectural review board member here. Thank you, Sarah, for being here. Um, so uh, Jay Gentry, who's Passive House, is here, um, interested in making sure any affordable housing we build is um, done in a very energy efficient and climate with climate um, protections th thought process, which is awesome. So um, I see Val is here. Val has awesome input on um, on how we can reach people and really communicate well with people. And I've had some great conversations with her as well. So. Any thoughts if anybody wants to really quickly mention anything? You guys all okay if I put your detail list and let everybody know who's part of our group and Okay, thank you. Jay, did you want to say something? Well, yes, Anastasia, thanks for the introduction. I just want to uh to remind most of the people on I believe already know, but the but Passive House uh, for the Envelope is not just about energy efficiency and the climate. It is also about extremely different indoor air quality, because when you make an airtight building, you get complete control of the continuous fresh air uh, and eliminate most of the pollutants and allergens. So it's it's uh, particularly if we're thinking affordable housing where many people are already health compromised, it's a it's a bigger factor even than the energy efficiency. And Jay, I was at a conference a couple, well, a few weeks ago, and I got to see a built out affordable housing development done in Minneapolis that was Passive House. And I was so excited and I thought of you the whole time. <laughs> well, and it didn't cost any more if they knew what they were doing. <laughs> it actually, yeah, it didn't cost much more. So, and they're, they're saving so much on utilities. They did say that. So I was so excited to see one in person. Thank you so much. That's yeah. terrific. I learned it all from you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. 
Can I just, um, so Josh asked us to make sure we have our, our full name and sort of if we're representing a group on there. I was just trying to figure out how, where do you rename in, in Teams? Do you know, Josh? I, was just trying I to... think it's when you enter the meeting. That's what <laughs> I named myself. <laughs> so um, go back and change it. We're, we're Teams noobs over here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> thought I'd ask people to do it, but uh, if anyone knows how to do that, speak up. Otherwise, we'll continue along and we will figure out, those of you who have one name, uh, make sure you get on the list of attendees properly. Yeah, uh, just adding in the chat would be great. Sure, great. Um, so let's go back here. So one big update is a congratulations to Anastasia, who is now the community development director for the city of Pacific Grove. Yay. Um, yeah, fantastic. So I just want to like, I think, take credit, actually, Anastasia. So you started out with our advisory committee group member uh, for Welcome Home, and then you became housing manager. Now you're you what know, next you're going to be what uh, governor of the state or something. <laughs> <laughs> right on up. Anyway, fantastic. I was, I was really happy to hear the news. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, just in terms of the uh, housing element related stuff, uh, I think folks probably know RENA appeals to so the regional housing needs allocation process. They released the draft plan in April. Uh, the appeals period ended, I think it was June 6th. They, I'd only saw, last I checked, a couple appeals had been filed, not a lot. Um, just so everybody knows, the process after this is that um, AMBAG, the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, collects information related to those appeals. People can actually respond to the appeal letter that was filed. Um, then they'd look at all that evidence. They actually have a hearing, which I think will probably be in September-ish, October at the latest. Um, they hear the evidence and then the board takes action on whether to change anything based on the appeal. The one thing to keep in mind is that if a, if a jurisdiction says, hey, our number's too high for X, Y, Z reasons, there's only very specific reasons they can request a change. Those numbers have to be then distributed elsewhere. Um, they can't reduce the overall number for the region. So there might be some changes that would impact Pacific Grove. We're not ex expecting it, but we'll see wh where things land. We'll have the final arena plan we expect in October. I would say they're a little behind schedule, maybe but October, November. Uh, any questions on that or any other information people on the call have about that? I, I saw that Jane asked if PG had appealed and we, we have not. We don't, it, we missed, we did not agree to appeal. And the two appeals, um, one is Greenfield and they felt that they had built already they met their arena for the past cycle and maybe a little bit over and they felt that should be counted into the next cycle and the sixth cycle and that um and then sand city was the other appellant and they just felt that um it was a lot for their small community um we have the third bullet here. We had a, a session with Planning Commission. There was a number of things that have been questions about it. I walked through the the arena numbers and then some specifics related to things like net uh, no net loss law from the state and some things. Um, I believe the the presentation was recorded. If anyone's interested, um, but we did have some feedback that we want to respond to. Um, not necessarily right now, but have any thoughts from you? We're going to talk a little bit more about sort of how we get the word out uh, for the community engagement opportunities and sort of how to make sure that we're doing things that are accessible to people. There was some feedback about wanting to have not just in-person events, but some more online engagement um, and then desire to see a more detailed work plan. And we have actually a detailed work plan. We'll share it today um, and then we'll be posting that up on the site and letting Planning Commission know about that. But is there anything else, Anastasia, you want to say in terms of that or other feedback? Okay. Yeah, no, just what I said before, you know, they maybe they'd like to see a little more formality with our committee, and I think we can easily do that. Everything is published. All the recordings and notes, minutes, and everything from all of our meetings are posted 
on our website on our housing element page so if anybody's interested or if you have any ideas go ahead and check it out and contact me and then just wanted to ask if folks on the call from the committee have other updates you want to share that are pertinent to the housing element or housing more generally anybody you can just unmute and speak up or use the raise your hand feature there's or if you press on the there's the three little dots at the bottom of the screen and there's a raise your hand option you can do that way too any other updates um, i was wondering i don't know if this is jenny I, I have a question though okay yes yeah. um what, what where is the city at as far as like an affordable housing ordinance or policy What's the status of that? Because I just I'm really feeling like as other projects come on board that are housing, we're missing these opportunities that are few and far between to include affordable housing. You mean in terms of like the conversation we had about a, a affordable housing overlay or inclusionary policy? Is that what you're meaning? Yeah, just like the city of Seaside, city of Monterey, if, if there's any projects, you know, Salinas, some require 20% affordable housing, um, some have in lieu fee. I mean, I would I would hope that in lieu fees are not happening anymore, but just where we require if there's uh, a project to include affordable housing. So where are we at on that? So we had started work on some of those items and then the arena numbers came out and we, uh, I, I, the conversation we had with the city was that a lot of those things were just going to get folded into the housing element update because we're going to be doing significant rezoning as a result of having significantly higher arena numbers than anticipated. So those efforts are getting folded into the housing element work and what will be the update to the general plan land use map and rezoning. So is there going to be a policy or, to, or an ordinance? And if so, when is that? It'll all be in conjunction with the adopt the housing element update adoption and the rezoning. Because rather than layering something onto existing zoning, we're going to be creating new zoning. Okay. Do you have a timeline then? Is that like a year or two years? Walk I'll walk through the we're going to walk through the work plan and that has the timeline. But yeah, we have to have the L well, we're just as a high at a high level, a draft element by first quarter of next year. And the element needs to be completed, adopted, and there's a whole process for that by December of next year. The rezoning will happen a little bit in, in parallel and then after adoption, just because of this okay. CEQA work that so I So then right now in the city, if there were to be a housing project, like say an apartment complex that has 10 units, there's no requirements for affordable housing. Is that correct? Uh, well, there's a incentives, but there's not a requirement. Okay, and is that common in the cities in Monterey County? Um, I don't know of all the cities around the county, but I, I just know that we've been working on the sites inventory, and right now there's nothing in the pipeline, so there's not anything currently that's happening that is not getting addressed. Okay, but if something were to come on the pipeline, there would be no affordable housing. Is that a correct statement? It would, it would, no, it depend on what the proposal was. There was a, a draft proposal the city received that I think was rescinded because some other things that I'm not party to, but um, that was actually had, I think, a 50% affordability in it as a, through an incentive program using a density bonus. But they, they, I don't believe that's still an active uh, proposal. Okay. Yeah. Um, there were David. Hands up. Yeah, Rosemary. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how I show you that my hand is up. So I. <laughs> yeah. If you hover over the images, I mean, I'll tell you. I mean, you can also just speak up. That's fine too. But there's okay. like three little dots that show up that says more yes. action. And yes. then up there, oh, it went away. 
There was a, oh, there's the raise your hand. Now, now it's on the bar, at least for mine. Oh, okay, <laughs> raise my hand, okay. Yeah, <laughs> there, your hand's but, up. Uh, just okay. because the, uh, Jenny had brought up um, the whole mention of affordable housing. Uh, Anastasia, I believe you were at the summit on homelessness that uh, was earlier um, this week. Is it earlier this week? No, last week, sorry, <laughs> Friday. And um, it was an incredible event. And um, they addressed the whole issue, of course, the relationship to homelessness and housing not being available. And I wondered um, if you had gotten any news there or encouragement or, you know, something with us all being together some possibilities come out of that for uh, housing for uh, very low income and low income people that was had been done successfully in the county or other places that was mentioned or just any hope. Did you get anything out of that meeting that could be helpful to us? Hi, yes, um, you know, thanks for attending that meeting. It was really great. Um, Jenny, council member Jenny McAdams was in our um, yes. city hall and uh, we, we, I popped in a little bit down there. I was mostly watching it up in my office because I was working on a few other things, multitasking, but um, definitely I've worked with all of the people involved in that um, awesome, you know, workshop and summit and um, actually worked on quite a bit of housing in the county myself um, with a lot of those players. And so, uh, and, and you know, the shelter opportunities. And I think that there's, I definitely feel that there's a lot we can continue to work collaboratively with everyone and come up with solutions. And I know we've got Jane Barr here in Eden Housing and Eden um, and a lot of housing developers now are actually adding in, um, Jan, you can probably talk about this too, 10% um, of their the development might have some really low income units. So that's one way um, to even get deeper affordability into an, a housing adult development. And um, like I say, really plugging in and working collaborati collaboratively with all of the players because we need nonprofit. We need to help support our nonprofits who are doing the work um, with people, getting them into services, and then having um, solutions for housing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rosemary. Thank you, Jenny, for attending. <laughs> Was there anyone else? I thought someone else had a hand up. I thought I saw another hand up, but if not, we'll continue. There were over, um, I'm trying to remember, it was 200 or 500. It was hugely attended. That's great. We had um, 560 um, regist registrants. And then um, at the peak of the event, the most that were on at one time was 319. So it was hugely attended. Um, it was a great event and um, through the county we'll be doing some follow up and I know um, at Community Solutions, um, Community Homeless Solutions, they'll be, you know, posting the recording. They have a toolkit also of the event. Um, if there were any slides or um, presentations that you like that are accessible um, on their website as well. Great. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move along. Um, so everyone can see this, hopefully. Uh, so the work plan, just some key dates, and I'm going to show some details that are going to make your eyes cross. But um, so December 23rd is a key date. That's the end of next year. It sounds like it's far away. It's not. Um, that is the deadline to adopt. And the way that the process works, the um, there's a HCD review, a public review, an HCD review, uh, and then sort of HCD says, yeah, you're you're meeting the letter of the law. The city adopts this, the planning commission and city council adopt the updated housing element, and then it gets sent for final certification by the state after adoption. So our deadline is to adopt by December or in December 
2023. There's a little bit of a grace period at the end, but we want to work with December 2023 as our operating deadline. Uh, there's a 90 day review period that HCD um, has, so we send it to them. They have 90 days to look at it and send us comments. There's usually a phone call in the, towards the end of that. And right now, in terms of the Bay Area jurisdictions going through the process, HCD is taking all 90 days. So on the 90th day, you get your letter. Um, and then if we need to make changes based on feedback, we then make changes, we resubmit it, and that starts another, um, this time a 60 day clock. And a lot of the Southern California jurisdictions are actually going through two or three rounds of review. So we have built into our timeline for two rounds of review um, to then, but still be able to hit the December 2023 adoption. Um, and part of that timeline also is when we have the draft element that we make as a public review draft, there needs to be a 30 day public comment period followed by a 10 business days where we um, go through the comments and, and show that we're um, either responding or have heard those comments. Um, let's see, just uh, some things on the work plan of, I'm just gonna call out a few things we're going to need to rezone. So that that is what's triggered a lot of sort of mm -hmm. thinking about the work effort. The city is putting out a request for proposals to do what they're calling a targeted general plan update. So it's not going to do the whole general plan update, which is a pretty huge work effort with a pretty large budget attached to it, but a more of a targeted update to the land use element to make sure that it's consistent with the zoning that we're going to be calling for rezoning the housing element update and then also the safety element which gets triggered as a requirement as they're updating the uh, land use element so and then the environmental review associated with that so there's sort of a bucket of work that is very strongly connected to the housing element but is separate from that would be under a different um, work effort but with a lot of interplay between them um, and also part of that is um, what the state calls objective design and development standards. I think we talked about that in this group before, but just as quickly, that means that you the, the standards you use to review development applications need to be objective, which means multiple people could look at them, know what they mean and apply them. So subjective standards, which is a lot of what you currently have in your design guidelines, et cetera, are going to have to be made into objective standards. So a subjective standard is it's compatible with neighborhood character. And multiple people might read that and have very different ideas about what that means. So it needs to be something that a development application, an applicant can look at it, say, OK, well, I'll design my project to meet your objective standards. And if I meet them, I get approval. So that's a whole area of work. Um, so there's going to be updates, land use element, safety element, adoption, new zoning, and development of objective standards, and all related to the CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act review. So there's an environmental review that's going to happen on the housing element, and there's a consultant that the city is engaged to do that review, and then there'll be a CEQA uh, review for the rezoning and general plan update. Most like the housing element environmental review will be what's called a mitigated negative declaration, whereas the one for the general plan and the rezone would be a much more comprehensive, more of a programmatic EIR. A lot of things that you don't need to <laughs> get in the weeds about unless you want to, um, but just wanted to know those all things are going on and they all have an implication for timeline um, and for budget. So this is, I'm, I just took, I've got a full uh, spreadsheet that shows all these things by just zooming in on a few things. This is the timeline for the arena. We talked about that. So looking at the final uh, allocation numbers being distributed in October, we don't expect a huge change from what we have in the draft. Um, this is the section it's, it's I just focused in on the months between now and the first quarter of next year. Uh, all the different things going on related to community engagement. So we are here if you can see my cursor over that housing and advisory committee the second meeting in july i know the city team's been doing updates in the city manager's newsletter just to to keep on people's radar um, the work going on in housing 
the city team has updated the um, project, the housing element update web page on the city's website and did a survey. We'll talk briefly about that today. And then Angela, uh, uh, who's an intern with the housing department, housing program is going to present that at the community workshop next week. There was, I think that 270 or so responses. Um, we did an intro session with council. Um, we had the session with planning commission last week. We're gearing up for some equity listening sessions. So this will be part of our effort to do some in language uh, outreach, um, reaching out to uh, low income residents, people with disabilities, uh, folks who often are not involved in these processes to make sure that their voices are helping to shape the plan and that we're understanding the housing issues that are running up against. Um, there's been a couple community workshops already. We've got a, one on the 25th. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about engagement planning uh, towards the end of this meeting and particularly related to do some online engagement. And then there'll be council and committee, uh, sorry, commission and council workshops uh, in the fall as we come out with the sort of the final sites work and, and start putting things in together to create the draft element that'll go out to the public in the first quarter. Um, and that's it's public hearings. There'll be public hearings in probably February or March of next year. And then the final adoption is towards December. And I'm not going to go into all this, but this is all the stuff that's going on related to the technical work. So there's there's works already underway. We've uh, had a session with staff to look at the existing element, what's working, what's not, what's been achieved. Uh, what needs to be carried forward, what's not going to be carried forward from the because we this is an update, not starting from scratch in terms of your housing element. Um, we've been working to identify some rezoning areas. I'm going to talk through those with you today. There's an affirmably further fair housing analysis we need to do. There's a housing needs analysis that's underway, a constraints analysis. There's a bunch of technical pieces which we will be working on that need to be part of the housing element update under state law. But I think for the purposes of community engagement, most of the focus is going to be on the sites. That's the stuff that people are going to see that we need to, to build consensus around where we're we going to change zoning to create additional housing capacity. And then there's a bunch of processes, sequences for um, reviews of the draft element and getting to certification. Just briefly on a firmly, and again, Raise, Rosemary, you have your hand up, but may I think that's from before. If, if you got questions. No, that was okay. from before. Thank you. Yeah. If you got questions, do use the raise your hand or just unmute and speak up. Um, I'm going to kind of fly through because I kind of want to get to the, the, the meaty stuff. Um, but I do want to highlight the AFFH. That's the, sorry, I use, we, all of us who work in this area, we use acronyms a lot. Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing is AFFH. So fair housing means that we need to make sure that our housing planning policies and programs help to create an even playing field for people in housing, that they're to overcome uh, discrimination and segregation. So it plays out in several different ways. One is we have to, we need to do a fair housing assessment to document how are we doing in terms of fair housing. Um, we need to apply a fair housing lens to our policies and programs to make sure that we're doing what we can to um, support people's rights, um, tenants' rights, and to um, provide information to landlords to counter discrimination. Um, it is going to be an important lens for us in the sites discussion that we're not furthering patterns of segregation, that we're creating uh, a mix of housing throughout the community. And it's also an important lens for us in the engagement planning to make sure that we're hearing from uh, an inclusive representative group of the community. I'm going to jump now to going into the weeds on sites. So I presented this table last time and also last week at Planning Commission. This shows what was called RENA 5, that was the fifth planning cycle, which was from 2015 to 2023. So we're coming to the end of that planning period, the fifth planning period under state housing element law. We're now doing the planning for the sixth planning period. So people call that ARENA 6, Regional Housing Needs Allocation RHNA 6. Um, these are the numbers that are in the draft RENA plan that AMBEG distributed in April. So obviously a big increase 
um, from 115 was the units that we were allocated in the last in Rena 5, 1,125 in Rena 6. We talked a little bit in the last meeting, the context related to, so this is compared to what was the allocation in the fifth cycle and the sixth cycle. Importantly, also we looked at how does it compare to the units that are on the ground today? So it represents about a 14% increase in terms of the units we need to plan for and show that we have capacity to support development of in the next eight years. About the same actually as the number of in the increase that was given to the county overall. Um, and those numbers, those percentages vary quite a bit um, for, for adjacent communities. Uh, but we're going to be zeroing in on these. So this is the breakdown by different income categories. Um, there is what's called area median income, AMI. That's the, you know, half the people are above the median income and half the people are below median income. And then the, the state housing law requires that we planning for different income categories. So very low income is 50% of AMI and below. And within that category is also what's called extremely low income, which we do not get a number for, but we need to demonstrate that we're, we're planning for extremely low income, which is 30% of AMI and below. So we have 339 units that we need to demonstrate that we have sites available to support the development of very low income housing and policies and programs in place to support that as well. Low income is 50 to 80%. Moderate income is 80 to 120 percent. That's what sometimes people call middle income housing, uh, but that's moderate income under state law. And then above moderate, that's our largest allocation actually, and that's 120 percent and up. So, questions on that? Okay, I see uh, Val, you have a hand up. Yeah, um, do you know the number for AMI, what their determination is? Um, I've, I've been working in several communities. What is the AMI in Pacific Grove, Anastasia? Oh, I think it's like 81,000 yeah. for a family of four. Okay. For a yeah. family of what? Four. Family four. four. Mm -hmm. And one more quick question. Um, are these, the proposed uh, increase is for rentals or for purchases or either? So in the, the sites, we don't designate anything as being for rent or for sale. It's all about density and unit capacity. But generally in the market, the, the higher uh, density, the multifamily get in the current market developed as rentals um, and the above moderate tend to be more single family homes. Um, single family homes sometimes get rented. Um, in fact, in Pacific Grove, there's a lot of second homes that, that get rented at times, but yeah, there, we don't, it, it doesn't designate that. Uh, Jenny. Uh, this was also brought up at the uh, the summit, and, and I've sort of asked this before, is anybody um, discussing getting the federal income guidelines adjusted um, to just maybe more better fit the cost of living in this area? Like the Bay Area, they recently, or not recently, I think last year, they adjusted theirs to over 100,000 um, for a family of four. So how, what is the process of that? And is that something that is, that you've been discussing? Jenny, yes, I can answer that. Sure. Um, so I've been working with the Housing Authority and the coalition with Roxanne on getting our fair market rents adjusted. And that's the number that we want adjusted so that any vouchers that we have will be higher. Um, We'll, we'll get more funding for each voucher. So Santa Cruz did this. Um, actually, Jane Barr is on the call too, and we're part of the um, the pipeline housing pipeline committee. And this is something that our pipeline committee has been working on. She and I are the chairs of that committee, co-chairs of that committee, um, and uh, it's actually been very successful. Many cities chipped in to help um, fund the study that needs to be done. 
and I believe it's underway. So um, I think we're we're having a housing pipeline committee meeting this Thursday, and we'll get an update on the status. But it is going, and it it really will will help. Great, thank you so much. And if I can be of assistance in any capacity or champion this for you, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. Urgently needed. <laughs> I can't see most people on the screen, but Sarah, I saw you were saying something. I don't know if you were speaking and muted or just talking to someone else. <laughs> Who was that? Sarah Boyle, you're, you're muted, we can't hear you. I'm sorry, I had to take a quick phone call. What was the question? I just saw you speaking. I couldn't tell if you were trying to say something muted or okay, I just checked. Sorry. No, no problem. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next slide. So something I talked with the Planning Commission about last week, and I think we brought up at the our first meeting two months ago, is this um, buffer that we uh, highly recommend that we include in the planning. It's not an exact number. We need to demonstrate in the inventory that we've got the capacity in that first column on the, on the slide here. The buffer is because there's what's called the no net loss law. If we identify a site and we say this site can accommodate I'll just make up a number, 50 units of very low income housing because the density that we have on the site. And then that site gets developed with five units of above moderate income housing. We now have a deficit in our inventory that we need to then identify another site that, can, that will accommodate those 50 units that didn't get built on the site that got built with something else. Wow. So the state, state law says you need to have an inventory to accommodate your regional housing needs allocation for the entire eight years of the planning period. So our recommendation is that we plan for a buffer so that if we lose a site to some other something else, and it could be that it gets developed with a hotel and no housing at all, um, that we are then okay. If we were to be in a position where we lose sites and we don't have the capacity anymore, then partway through the planning period, we would have to rezone some additional sites. So if we're gonna go through the process of rezoning, better to think big um, and have more than what the arena is, not hugely more, but some more. Um, and I'll just underscore it like most communities, including Pacific Grove today, have more zoning capacity on the book than what you have built on the ground. So it's, it's a, I think, a, a good practice to do, and it definitely would be good in terms of avoiding having to do another rezoning in four years if that were to come up. So these are the numbers. It's not an exact, we, we can do 15%, 20% buffer. Probably more important that we have the buffer in the lower income categories than the above moderate income category. Um, but these are the numbers if we were to apply a 20% buffer. And we don't need to like land on it exactly today, but I wanted to start uh, thinking about what that means. Right. Any questions on that? Okay. And I see there's a lot of chat going on. I'm not able to keep up on the chat, but Josh or Anastasia, if there's something there that you think we need to speak to, let me know. We will. Okay. I'm going to go on to talk about sites. So site strategies. I said it already. We have to advance firmly further for housing. That means we can't say, well, let's just make this whole part of town all the higher, the higher density uh, area for our low-income sites. We need to think about a more distributed strategy. Um, there are a lot of new requirements. I won't get into all of them this round of the housing element. For people who went through housing element updates before, there's a lot of different requirements now. So it's a, it's a higher bar to show that a property is not just theoretically available to be built with housing, but actually it's likely, or we have the, it's, um, we have all the rules in place and it's, there's no obstacles to getting developed. So if there's a site that's been in your inventory for like, two of the previous rounds, that's not a site, unless we have a really good story to tell about like something changed that is gonna become developable now. If there's a site that we've identified that you could build 100 units of housing on and it has a wetland in the middle of it, then that's not really a site. So 
we have to like really go through in each of our sites and make sure that it actually could be developed um, and that we have the densities in place and programs policies in place to support housing development. We will be doing rezoning starting the process while we're doing the housing element, but it's not going to be complete before we finish the housing element. We have three years if we hit the deadline and get certifi certified, we have three years to complete the rezoning so we can have a program to rezone in the housing element. If we do not hit the deadline, which could be for circumstances beyond our control, it still applies that we would then have a one year deadline. So the city's planning to have the rezoning done within one year of the December 2023 deadline. So by December 2024, rezoning would be complete. So that shouldn't be an issue. Um, and then there's just a number I want to make sure if it's on everyone's mind. 20 units to the acre is what uh, HCD considers the default density. If we have sites identified for very low and low income housing that are 20 units to the acre, then we are at that default density um, to be considered for for being appropriate. If we say, no, we have a site that we want to zone at 16 units the acre, but we think it could be developed with low income housing, we are going to need to show our homework about why we think that is actually possible. So 20 units to the acre is the default. Um, that'll be kind of a guiding principle for us. And you've got zoning categories in town that are at that, but we'll want to be looking at sort of uh, do we have enough? So strategy we've talked about. Um, I'm going to go through details on some of these um, accessory dwelling units, looking at the downtown and your commercial corridors, Forest Hill and Middle Housing. I'm going to talk about those four. There's also some stuff we could look at related to lot splits, smaller lots and implementation of SB9 and having a supportive policy for that. That's not going to create a lot of units. It could create some, and they're mostly going to be above moderate. So these strategies oh. focused in particular on where could we create capacity for the moderate and lower income categories. Um, so I'm going to talk quickly about ADUs. There's not a lot to discuss, but ADUs is a different beast than the rest of the things that we're doing in the rezoning because it's any single family property in town could theoretically build an ADU under state law today. Everyone, every single homeowner could come in tomorrow and say, I want to build an ADU. And the, the, the uh, under state law, you'd have 60 days to approve those ADUs. It's not going to happen that everyone comes in tomorrow. So what AD, what HCD does is says, okay, well, show us what, how many ADUs have been being built in the recent years under in your jurisdiction, and you can just take that number, average number, and multiply it by eight, and we'll give you credit in your site inventory for that. So you had a really big year last year. You had, four, you had 40 permitted ADUs in Pacific Grove last year. You had 20 in 2020, and then you have eight so far this year that have been permitted or in process. So we'll take the average of those three years. We'll see where 2022 lands. But right now, based on your three year average, if no one else came in with any more ADUs this year, your average is 23. So we multiply that by eight and we would say we're going to have 184 ADUs built in, <laughs> in the next eight years. And those based on survey data that's already been looked at by HCD and we say 30% of those are going to be very low income housing, 30% are low income, 30% are moderate income and 10% are above moderate. And the reason that some of those fall into that very low income category is a lot of people use them uh, for family members or friends and make them available for free or very, very low rent. Um, so there's data on that and that's how we would how that's how we, you'll, you'll count them in your annual reports and how we'll count them in the inventory. Nice thing about ADUs is a great way to create rental housing uh, that's relatively affordable in your single family neighborhoods. And if you look at the map on the right, all those yellow areas are single family neighborhoods. So it's most of your land area. So it's one of the strategies we have to create housing in all the neighborhoods. Questions on that? So in terms of ADU strategy, um, I see Chaps, you have a hand up. 
And yes, I, yes, I do. Uh, thanks, David. Um, just on, quickly on the ADUs, um, is by ADUs by that definition, do you also imply joint the J J J ADUs as yeah. well? And, and does this capture the statistic captures J J D ADUs too? Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Claudia. Is there any plan for the city to do any incentives for people who want to build ADUs that maybe can't afford it because of their finances or whatever? Because some people don't have the money to do that right now, but would like to do it. Um, Anastasia, you want to ask, answer that? Yeah, that's that's a great um, question. And actually last week I attended a um, webinar on financing ADUs because this is a big issue out there. Um, and there are a lot of people working on how to better finance it. Um, the state does have a financing program and I believe we have it somewhere on our website, on our housing page. Um, you have to qualify as low to moderate income and uh, then you are able to qualify for the ADU program. But I'm, I'm keeping tabs on how we might better be able to finance them. Because as an industry right now, it is something that people are recognizing. This is part of the square footage and you know, just trying to figure out different ways to um, count it and how to, how to work it out to ensure it and finance it and everything. So thank you. Was did was that uh, that you attended? Was that through the Turner Institute? Yes, I think so. Did you attend yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. So thank Great. you. Yeah. And I'll just point out. So there are um, under state law, we need to have policies in place that are supportive of uh, ADUs. Um, we could do things that are above and beyond that, and and based on that make the case that we think we'll have more ADUs or we'll be at the upper end of that recent year trend um, than what we have just through the standard take the three year average. Um, there, anyway, so there's some things that, you know, in terms of incentivizing or encouraging ADUs this year, so your 2022 number is higher than eight. Um, and then there's things that we could do longer term that could uh, serve as uh, evidence that we anticipate more ADUs than what we've seen in the last few years. But just as a word, you know, it's not going to be like, oh, well, we think we're going to double the ADUs. We're going to have 80 per year. That's not going to happen. Uh, but we could potentially say we, we anticipate like a 10 percent increase because we're waiving fees or we're doing pre-reviewed plans or we're doing other things to make it easier and more economically viable. And then to your point, Claudia, also things that we're doing to in particular help homeowners who are income qualified to develop ADUs. Um, I see Jenny, is your hand up for this one or is that from before? Yeah, it is. Um, so how is the city, can you help me understand how the city is sort of tracking ADUs, who they're being rented to um, and for how much? Because um, like the prior commenter said, the people who can build the ADUs are have access to resources, right? So the people who probably most need ADUs to help support their financial sustainability in Pacific Grove as homeowners don't necessarily have the resources. So how does the city track that the ADUs are being rented and um, what are the numbers on that? Yeah, oh, quickly, just actually I had, um, we did a quick little study on a, some of the the ADUs this past year. Um, I had my interns <laughs> send out some surveys, and um, we did get some feedback. And a and a lot of them currently are owned, I think, by prop property owners that are able to build them. And a lot of what we're we're getting feedback on is that it's family members who are able to rent to their in, or provide the housing for their their family members. So I think that's a lot of what we're seeing. Um, I, I think a lot of people are just not renting them out to to the public from what we saw from that quick little survey. And is that like family members living full time or family members like visiting occasionally? I'm thinking I, what we're hearing and seeing is it's family members who live there. People mm -hmm. are building them for their family members. Yeah. For care for their elderly. 
yeah, so we're hearing people who move out of their main unit, the um, and the younger family gets at the larger unit. So that seems to be happening. Great, thanks. I'm going to keep moving on. Um, so ADUs is going to be part of the strategy regardless, and we'll see if there's maybe some additional programs or things we want to do to incentivize. Um, I'm going to go through some of the geographies, areas where we could look at rezoning. I don't have numbers in terms of how much could be generated, but I want to start talking about sort of what's this, what's the situation, what's the context, and how much do we think might be possible to do there. And this is basically setting us up for some community conversation about, okay, if we're going to create new housing, where does it go and how much um, how much is appropriate in each location? So downtown is, as you know, not a huge area. Um, I've just, this is just based on the current zone, zone boundary for what's called commercial downtown zoning CD. Uh, it is a total of about 21 acres. We think there's 163 parcels. There's a little confusion because some of these, uh, if they're condoized or something, they show up as multiple units, even though they're one building. So we're going to fine tune that. But there's a lot of smaller properties. As you know, there's a number of historic properties. Um, those are unlikely to redevelop. We won't include those in the inventory. There are some larger sites, though, that are potential for um, redevelopment. And what we'll be looking at is what's an appropriate approach to density and changing to standards to create additional housing capacity, policy changes, et cetera. So just a note under state law, a mixed use zoning, if we're going to put something that's zoned for mixed use in the housing inventory, there's two conditions. One, it needs to have a requirement that there be residential in, the, in a new development. And there has to be the opportunity that 100% residential could be built on the site. So um, we'll be looking at that as we look at potential candidate sites. We wouldn't take this whole area and say this whole area is in our sites inventory. We are going to have to identify specific sites. Currently, your general plan density is 20 to 30 units to the acre. Um, you can get a bit of a bonus. Um, it's a little vague um, in terms of you can get a 0.3 FAR bonus if it, it uh, has uses that further the goal of the general plan. It has a 40 foot height limit. So we'd be looking at potential increases to the height limit, increases to FAR, and increases to density in order to create additional housing capacity. It could be done to the zone district. It could be done as an overlay on the sites that we see as particular opportunity sites. Um, and we could create um, as more of an incentive approach where we would give you more if you have affordable housing. Under current state law, you can get a density bonus of 50%. Um, but just as a note, some of your, a lot of these are pretty small. So they're, you know, you might be able to, you know, on something that is half an acre, build 10 to 15 units on it, a 50% density bonus might get you to 15 units. So um, it's not, uh, you, you need to think sort of through the, the lot size and sort of how some of these things play out. Another thing to think about as we get into some of the rezoning conversations is potential for more of a form-based code. So not controlling based on units per acre, but more based on defining the building envelope and let people put however many units they think is appropriate within that based on the market. Mm. Another area is what David, I've, sorry, could you address a question sure. about when assessing the site for feasibility likelihood to be developed, is the landowner's willingness to sell the property considered? Um, yeah, we don't have to. I mean, particularly for the larger sites, we would probably want to talk to the property owner and see is this something that they would consider. And they, they could sell it or they might redevelop it themselves. Um, for the smaller sites, we don't need to get a, a property owner letter for each one. Um, but in the downtown, probably it's mostly going to be focused on the larger properties and we'd probably have conversation and want some consent for being included in the inventory, in the site's inventory. That's one of the things that so we need to demonstrate. So it's not for this round of the house element. It's not just sort of the theoretical. It's an acre site, and we zoned it for 40 units the acre, and that are therefore going to count as 40 units. We have to to take the realistic development capacity. So even if we zoned it at 40, but you pile on all the other regulations we have, you can really only maybe get to 30. Then we can only count as 30, and we need to show that that's market feasible. Mm -hmm. 
so that if you track land costs and construction costs, that you can actually still build what we're saying is possible to build on that site. So there's going to be a little bit, and some of the key sites in particular, some perform analysis and things we have to do to demonstrate that it's feasible. Right, I'm going to run through some of the other sites, uh, areas, not sites, um, and then have some discussion. Oh. Sorry, yeah. one more question. Can you explain why the height is being limited to 40 feet? That's what's in your current zoning. This isn't a proposal. This is describing what's there today. Those regulations. So that'd be, we'd be looking to sort of what's the increase that we think is appropriate as we get into the specific sites. What I call east side commercial, I think actually your general plan calls it. Um, so uh, this is not a big area. It's about 10 acres in total, 61 parcels. Um, again, not all of them are going to be in the inventory, but there's some opportunity here to look at properties along the commercial corridor that are currently zoned for light industrial commercial or for R4, your residential four, which is your higher density residential zone. Um, right now you allow up to 29 units the acre there's it varies 1.5 to 2.5 far and i'm sorry do people know far is for area ratio that's the amount of building to the size of the property so if you were to build all the way to the property line at a 1.5 far that means you'd have a one and a half story building covering the entire property but very few developments build to the whole property line so it'd be like uh, three-story building on half of the property. Anyway, so it varies a little bit between those areas, but that's an area that uh, we think is appropriate to look at increases in density, and that could create some additional housing capacity through mixed use or through 100% um, residential developments. Um, you also have uh, sort of higher density current zoning in along Lighthouse Avenue going past downtown. Um, and on Forest Avenue going from Forest Hill down to downtown. Those are those areas that are circled there. Um, that currently is R4 zoning. Um, it allows, depends on the specifics, but 20 to 29 units the acre, 30 foot height limit. And we could look at increasing what's allowed in those areas and zoom in on some of the properties that we think are particularly uh, promising candidates for potential redevelopment. So this I just listed some of these strategies, ways to think about strategies for creating additional capacity in these types of areas that um, are closer into downtown. They have a higher density comparatively, um, but we could look at increasing the base density in these areas. Um, we could look at shifting to a form-based code approach, which I mentioned. Um, we could do this through, or in addition to raising the base, we could also do an overlay to incentivize affordable housing. So that's what state density bonus law basically says. You can get a 50% increase in density if you have certain levels of affordability that are built in. In some ways, this is this helps us get to a larger number of affordable units because there's an incentive to do more than what might be required under an inclusionary program. So an inclusionary program, you'd say, well, you're going to build a market rate development of X number of units, 20% of those are going to be required to be affordable. That's going to take a lot of market rate development to get to the numbers we have for our lower income. So we want to see ways which we can get to developments that are 100% affordable, that are 50% affordable. Um, so a more of a incentivized approach might be a way to do that if we can get to a comfort level with the density that would come along with that. Um, in all these mixed use zones, we need to make sure that there's, re if it's going to redevelop, it needs to include residential. So you couldn't do 100% commercial development. Um, we could look at uh, inclusionary requirements. We need to do the math to show that the, the, the development remains economically viable. Um, and all of these would need to be done. There would be objective design standards that would be done in conjunction as part of the rezoning. I'm throwing a lot at you, so I'm going to be quiet for a moment and take questions because I got some more to throw at you. <laughs> um, and this is all sort of strategy level. This isn't specific sites or specific proposals, but is this resonating with you as areas to look at? Freaking you out? Like, where are you at? Claudia. 
Um, I'm hearing this for the first time. I appreciate it. Um, I think it's what we need to look at because we aren't going to make the arena numbers go away. That's for sure. Um, and we need to be sensible about how we're going to do it. So I really appreciate looking at it in this manner. Um, my question just had to deal with uh, developing a Jeff objective design standards. When are we going to be doing that? So correct me if I'm wrong, Anastasia, I believe that's part of the RFP the request for proposals that's going out from the city for the general targeted general plan and rezoning. I'm going to try to squeeze it in there for sure. Okay. <laughs> what 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 kind of data are we looking at? Um, data for I mean because the design the objective design guidelines are a must. We've got to do it. But when are we looking at putting out the RFP that's going to include that? I'm hoping we can Please. get that RFP out in it. I'm going to be ambitious and just say a couple of months we've got a new city attorney and I've got to get through some internal hoops but I'm with you this the objective design standards are very critical oh, Amen. Oh, <laughs> thank you thank you yeah yeah Val I was just going to say I think the places that you designated are I mean that that's it we have very limited space so uh, it makes a lot of sense I have two questions. Um, you know, there's that contentious project on the American Tin Cannery development, um, and that's I think what you said was the East Corridor. Uh, like, is there a possibility of of mm, including now in that project um, that the development company add? residential housing or is that too late so that's one question and then the second question is how is the city figuring out how we're going to get water for all of the this new development so on the first one i think they're through the process so there's that the, it's done what is done is done um i think there's two things to think about in terms of there there might i'm not saying that every commercial zone becomes a mixed use zone but if it, under state law if it becomes a mixed use zone and it's in our housing element inventory then we need to have a mechanism that housing would have been part of that development um another thing to think about related to all commercial development is uh, uh what's called a linkage fee so it's similar to an in lieu fee for housing but it's a, a fee that a commercial development help pays in order to help pay for the affordable housing need that is generated. Uh, there's a study that has to be done to establish what that nexus is and what the amount should be, but that's one. On the waterfront, you, this is a, obviously a big constraint. Um, we'll be looking at in the inventory, particularly properties that have a water meter, um, because currently that is a requirement in order to do development on the site. Um, but we're going to be working through sort of some of the, uh, let's say, conflicting state laws. <laughs> so under the moratorium, we're not supposed to do any change in zoning that increases intensity of development. So obviously, we're doing that because there's a different state law that says we need to do that. So um, there are the city does have some water allocation. There are some opportunities to prioritize that for affordable housing. That'll be part of the work ahead in the in terms of finishing the housing element on time we have to speak to the constraint of water we need to point to the things that are being done to address that constraint but the housing element itself is not going to figure out the water solution um and no. yeah i'm going to i want to get to a couple things i wanted to have you guys respond to I, I just put this together in terms of looking at so these are these strategy areas are ones that are kind of close in to services they're downtown they're on commercial commercial corridors they're walkable um so they would have those on the con side some um change of character impacts um to areas that people think of as sort of the heart of the community uh potential view impacts um and in total i mean uh, there are some opportunity sites like one that's in this photo here the lighthouse theater parking lot uh uh don't have a watch but is next to a site that does have a water meter uh there are some opportunity sites that we could probably see you know 
dozens, if not over a hundred units of, of capacity created. Um, but when you look at the whole area and you take out historic properties and you take out things that are unlikely to redevelop, there's not a huge amount of unit creation that could be seen in these areas, but there's some, it's not insignificant, but it's not like we do this and we're done. Um, I'm going to move on quickly. Forest Hill is an area that we talked about in the Welcome Home Initiative. It has a specific plan that really doesn't speak to housing at all. It's an old specific plan. The general plan's old. Um, but there are some areas here. Again, you can see in the just the parcel patterns here, there's some sites that are pretty small and others that are fairly large. Some are not likely to redevelop. Others potentially could. It has pretty suburban zoning in place. Uh, 1.0 FAR 35 foot height limit. Um, multifamily residential is allowed, but it's really not sort of set up to encourage it. Uh, but we could look at this area as for rezoning and increases in intensity to support redevelopment, probably in some a combination of mixed use developments um, and some uh, all residential. So that's another area. Um, We'd look at it's a similar toolkit or options to what we could do here as to the other areas downtown, but obviously a different uh, level of intensity and different sort of approach in terms of this is these are the kinds of areas that I think of as transformative redevelopment, whereas sort of the areas downtown and Forest Ave, et cetera, more sort of infill opportunities that um, are fitting into an existing pattern. Some of these areas if some of the larger sites were developed, it would probably be a pretty significant rethinking of how those properties work. And this is where we would definitely need to be in um, hand in hand with the property owners if we were going to include one of these larger sites in the inventory. Pros and cons there. I'm going to just pause for any quick thoughts there. I just have one more to go through and then have some other questions for you. I just want to bring up really quick that, you know, just looking at where we think we can increase density is really going to affect business, too. So I think that's something we want to bring into our planning and into our outreach is really working with our chamber and anything you guys can think of. Just shoot me an email because we will want their input. And then the last one of the categories that we talked about in Welcome Home was middle housing. So this is, or people call it missing middle. The market right now likes to build apartment buildings and single family homes, and our zoning is set up to reinforce that. Um, these are areas, the ones that are outlined in sort of the little dotted line pattern are areas that in the Welcome Home initiative we identified as, well, maybe we could look at creating uh, some zoning that would encourage um, duplexes, triplexes, townhomes in these parts of town that are close in, they're walkable. They actually, if you go down these areas that down the street, they actually already currently have duplexes and things that were built before this zoning was put in place. So there's a pattern there, a historic pattern, it would be sort of building on that and creating some opportunities. We looked at um, this a little bit in terms of economic analysis. The challenge right now is the way that the regulations are set up and the market conditions. There's actually more of an incentive for people to buy older duplexes, tear them down and build a single family home. Mm -hmm. So we would need to look at both rezoning and then also changes to the zoning standards so that it is economically viable, attractive, not just viable, but attractive to build townhomes or duplexes rather than a single family home potentially make single family homes either conditional or not permitted use. That doesn't mean that single family homes that are there would be torn down. That means that like the duplexes that are there today, they would still be there. Um, but in some of these areas, there's older duplexes that if they were torn down, they, you couldn't rebuild it with a duplex because your zoning doesn't support that. Um, so these are, you know, it's not a definitive line. We did it pretty quickly in Welcome Home. It's not a huge number of units that would come out of, of this kind of a strategy, but it would create some different kind of outcomes than um, just multifamily and single family homes. And yeah, those some quick pros and cons on that. Thoughts on that? I know I'm throwing a lot at you. 
Okay. Are there other strategies that, particularly geographies, that you think we should include in the mix as we go into this site strategy conversation? I did. I didn't go through, but we've identified. So SB nine is. Uh, I think we talked about it previously. Uh, Senate Bill, which allows for every single family property in the state to be subdivided and built, essentially in total four units to two units on each site. All the analysis we've done is that we're not going to see a ton of action. The city's had some inquiries from folks on what SB nine allows, but uh, there's not been any applications that I'm aware of. Um, but it's something that we could look at doing a local ordinance that makes it easier to do that rather than harder um, and potentially then count some units. It would be above moderate income unless there's some kind of subsidy involved. But um, and then there's the opportunity sites, which we have discussed before and had a session on and, and we'll be looking on some of those specific sites, city owned sites and school district sites as part of this effort. But I'm not going to talk about them right now. As we frame these scenarios, anything that's not on the list that you think should be a part. I see Chaps has his hand raised and maybe a couple of others here. Great. Sorry, I've got too many. I've got Don Murphy and Chaps. I don't know who came up first, but you want, to, you want me to pick one? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and um, call on Chaps. Thanks for picking me. Um, hey, um, th this is more of a general question, uh, but um, last time around we, we had the home key project uh, and there were certain aspects to that project that came in really last last minute. Uh, and one of those being, um, I would say, a deadline to meet funding requirements. Um, so it, on that note, uh, is there anything here within the housing element or maybe on a parallel side, uh, kind of like side note, where we're tracking what kind of funding elements are available from either HCD or others, uh, which will help us through the planning process uh, and or through housing opportunities? Is there a separate track or something that's being considered and should be aware and, and and really on that same note should be should we be aware collectively as a group or or as a city that certain timelines have to be met with respect to funding guidelines i'll address that really quick i'll just say um funding timelines sometimes are very quick on some of the programs um if we're working on tcac funding with a affordable housing developer developer for example um like we track okay when when are the program funds through the state available and when do we need to spend them so i'm always have my eye on state funding and unfortunately you know home key had a, has had in the past very extreme timelines which has made that program difficult um throughout the state but people are jumping on throughout the state because of the subsidy involved never have we seen the amount of subsidy that's come through from the state for a housing development like that so we're we're tracking that okay and, and just to, so I, I get this clear to, are there grants available for planning purposes there have been um in recent years um such as sb2 plha Leap, reap. I, I could go through all the different ones, but we're definitely tracking all of them and making sure that we um, utilize those. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for the question. And I think Don has been waiting next. I, 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 I confess I always think about politics. And I guess I can see a scenario where we would adopt a housing element. And unfortunately, the necessary zoning lags behind. And I'm nervous about a council um, refusing to do the necessary upzoning to make the housing element you know, real. And you know, other than HCD, I guess, you know, not being happy, what, you know, what would happen in that case? Well, let's say 
HCD would be more than not happy. Um, so the, the, one of the big changes also at the state level is there is now what's called the housing accountability unit uh, that has been funded and set up. And they are going to be monitoring implementation of housing elements. And in particular, if there's a program to rezone, making sure that the rezoning happens. And if the rezoning does not happen, then the housing element become not certified. And there's a bunch of repercussions to not having a certified housing element. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Yeah. I think, we're, yeah, we want to make sure that what we have in the housing element is like there's a commitment to actually then making it so. And that the way that's set up right now, the, that process actually would be well underway before we're in the element. Um, and John? Thank you, David. Is this uh, Anastasia? I think this is really for you. Is there any um, any ability of the city to annex any additional property? Uh, I think we talked about the uh, Mission Linen, um, but also even below that, the I don't can't remember if it was a Shell or a Chevron or whatever that first property is on Pebble Beach uh, at 17 Mile and Sunset, which is probably good for only about 10, but nonetheless, it should have water. Yeah, I appreciate those ideas. And, um, you know, I just thought we could just annex all of Pebble Beach, but <laughs> I don't think it's so popular. Um, and, and maybe creating an island off of PG, you know, PG Island. I have dreams. But... <laughs> like Dubai? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, I appreciate all those ideas. If there's anything, um, bring them up. Thank you. We'll look into it. I think we're getting a little short on time. I, I, you know, one of the things and maybe we'll follow up with an email to y'all is um, as we set up to have this conversation, we want to have some criteria we're using to evaluate these options. And obviously creating housing capacity is the criteria. But there's other things also we want to, to make part of the conversation. This isn't just about like units, creating units, but, you know, supporting walkability, sustainability, um, supporting local businesses by having more, you know, sort of people nearby. Would like your thoughts in terms of how we set up a trade-off conversation and helping people think about, like, you know, what are we trying to achieve here? That goes beyond. So, I mean, we'll put a draft together and send something out for your for your thought and feedback um, in the coming week or two. Because I want to have at least a few minutes to talk about the community engagement piece. So that was one thing we heard from Planning Commission is um, feeling like most people don't know this is going on um, and that it's an important conversation. How can we reach more people? There is a uh, workshop planned next Monday. I'm excited to be down there in person for it. It's going to be in person meeting. So if um, you're able to make it, please come and join 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the community center. Anastasia, anything you want to say on that front? No, we just hope you can all come and join us in person. Be nice to see everybody. We know COVID's starting to get, you know, people getting more nervous and things are happening with that. But um, we have had during COVID several meetings in person and um, they've all gone very well uh so far so knock on wood this will be the same and we'll have more opportunities for online but this is now before we get into the colder season where more and kids start going back to school it's nice to have a a, a in-person workshop so hope you all can attend thank you I just ask people to help get the word out about that um so the city also did a survey on the housing element update web page. Um, although one of the planning commissioners confessed having filled out the survey more than once, but <laughs> so, uh, but they had the surveys closed and Angela um, is going to be doing a presentation at the workshop about what, what, they, what the responses were. Um, and then we're looking at sort of some more online engagement. I thought if like, I pulled it up on here, one thing I'm looking at is because we've got these areas and sort of talking about okay, how much housing goes where, there's this kind of cool tool called Balancing Act. It actually was developed as a um, pub for public engagement in budgeting exercises. 
and they've transformed it a bit and are using it as a way to think about sort of how you uh, um, get people involved in thinking about where housing should go. So this is the city of Lafayette's website where they implemented, use this tool. And basically this map, you go to these different areas. So they have to have 2,114 units. Um, they have a buffer of 1,000 that they decided on. So 3,171 units you need to distribute on this map to get to a housing plan. And you basically can go here and choose to add or remove density in different parts of the community. And by doing so, you can see at the top, the little thing changes and you can get closer or further away from your housing plan. So let's say we were just, let's go total max here on Deer, Deer Hill Corridor, I get to a housing plan. Um, so I need to get to the point that the bar turns green on the top. And basically then people can go on here 24 seven, do their plan, hit submit. And we just sort of get a sense of like, where are people allocating more housing intensity just as a point of input, but also a way to get people to understand like, we have to put the numbers somewhere. Where do we put them? Um, so we're looking at using this kind of a tool to support some online engagement in the coming couple of months. Uh, and we, one of the feedback was some people are not comfortable doing in person, so we might look at doing uh, more of a virtual workshop, maybe um, in a couple of months. And then we do need to, we're gonna be focusing on some equity focused engagement, um, building on some of the stuff we did in Welcome Home where we'd had some in language workshops with folks and work with the school district in particular to get some folks um, who maybe don't live currently in Pacific Grove, but are very much in the community and part of the community and sort of hearing sort of their experience in trying to find housing. Mm -hmm. A few hands up, um, I th are they new hands or are they hands that were up before, I don't know. Speak, unmute and speak up if you've got some, a comment or question. Okay. Anyone else? We've got one minute. Here's next steps. Uh, help us get the word out about the 25th. Uh, we're gonna work on refining those strategies and sort of being able to present them in a more understandable way for the general public and set up some of these trade-off exercises that won't happen next week, but it'll be in the in the next round. Um, and we're just so you know, behind the scenes, not in the workshop, we're doing a lot of work on the actual developing the draft element, the update to the, some of the analyses that are required. Final questions, comments, feedback. Sorry, it's been a bit of a whirlwind, but a lot to cover. I hope we can think about outside the box. I agree. <laughs> I, I used to work with an artist who helped us with engagement and who said, well, outside of which box, though? <laughs> <laughs> I hope we can get some of our local banks excited about somehow partnering with us or thinking outside the box with them taking some responsibility for achieving it. Yeah, I mean, with I, Barbara Meister has been a great participant uh, in a bunch of our work from the aquarium. It'd be great to get more business involvement, um, right? Both in terms of supporting their employees um, who are looking mm -hmm. for, but also sort of thinking about how we integrate housing, right. more housing downtown and commercial areas. Right. I was just thinking of banks offering people incredibly low loans and st yeah. you know things that are unheard of but well no i mean as the interest rates have been going up being able to offer low interest or no interest loans is becoming much much more attractive to those who yes. are trying to build things yes 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 what would get people to say yes i'm going to do that now yeah so local banks local particularly great Thank you all for being here. Um, feel free to reach out if you got questions or any follow-up comments. Um, send to myself or Anastasia, and we will see you in two months, if not before. Okay. Great job. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. Bye. Stay safe. Bye, <clears throat>